Is there intelligent life in the universe? Will we one day be able to time travel? And which one of these two scenarios is more likely? And what if aliens were actually future versions of humans? Today on What If Discussed. Welcome to What If Discussed. I'm Peter Smeechin. And I'm Richard Garner. So, Pete, aliens. Do you believe in them? Do I believe in them? I mean, please. I mean, that's a long conversation. It's a complex conversation, as we're going to find out today. But let me start with you. Do you believe we are alone in the universe? Just you and me here. Yes, right just now. you and I. Well, of course, there's two guys our crew. <laughs> to be in the camera there's people there. here as well. But uh, yes, we're on a bit of an island. But I guess what I mean are human beings on the big blue marble here, unique? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Hmm. I think yes, we are unique in that we are probably, and this is very uh, hubristic, I'm sure, mm -hmm. that we are the sole intelligent species in at least our galaxy. Hmm. I don't know what's happening in the other galaxies. Nobody does. No. Obviously, it's smart to say, well, there's this many planets that are in Goldilocks zones mm -hmm. of suns about the size of this and Earth's with this and with gravity and water and blah, blah, blah. There's got to be, you know, they say thousands of mm -hmm. planets similar to ours. Doesn't mean that there's intelligent life on them. Mm. There could be amoeba on them. There could so be, you're open to life. I'm open to life for sure. I think if there is something as intelligent as us, it would have found us. Well, maybe not as intelligent as us, mm -hmm. a little smarter than us, mm -hmm. it would have found us. If it's not as smart as us, it wouldn't have found us. I believe and that's why the would... Fermi paradox. Well, there you go. Ish. Fermi paradox ish. Yeah. Something like that. But the, to your point, the idea that we would have sort of bumped into each other at some point, whether they're looking for us, whether they would have found us, whether we would have seen evidence of them mm -hmm. over the course of X amount of time. I would personally argue that our time that we've had that level of advanced technology that we could know those things is a blip in human history. So we still get caught up in the idea that we kind of got things figured out. And I think it's very early in the game. Mm -hmm. In, you know, if we've been around, you know, the planet's been around for four billion years, this version of human beings supposed to be a couple hundred thousand, I guess, a hundred thousand, whatever it is. So is it possible that, you know, in a couple thousand years, we would have more information and ability and telescopes, whatever, to be able to mm -hmm. figure this out better? But the math is compelling to me. I do believe that, exo, you know, the more exoplanets we find, it seems to be like a yearly thing now, right? It's like every second week you're hearing about, oh, they found an exoplanet, to your point that, you know, whether yeah. it's, uh, or, or even when we grew up, water on Mars was like, forget about That's it. Not no chance. Yeah. Bam, we find yeah. evidence of water on Mars, right? But there was always little green men. Yeah, right? and, suppose, right. and that was the interesting starting point. It's a good sort of segue to what we're going to be discussing today because that idea that kind of got, you know, imprinted on us, uh, uh, to your point, from probably science fiction when we were kids and was this idea that there was a very specific kind of you know, look to, an look alien, to yeah. a short, sort of hairless, big eyes, green or gray, large brain, large brain, take us to your leader, like that type yeah. of stuff. So A, it was easily dismissed and marginalized, but B, it kind of created this idea that that's what we would be looking for or expecting because it also coincided with a lot of, you know, UFO uh, um, accounts of, of whether it be seeing or abduction or whatever. But what I hadn't considered before, although it was kind of pitched to me by my brother-in-law a sci-fi book idea back in the day that was similar to the theory that we're going to be discussing today with the author, well, literally, the man who wrote the book on the subject, yeah. um, about the idea that, in fact, not to say there's no alien life, but that these visitations, these, these greys, these little green men, or whatever we've discussed over the time, aren't actually from off-planet or alien. They're, in fact, us from the future, time traveling back. Now that, how, how does that land with you? More or less compelling? More compelling and more possible, I would think, because if we, if we are us in the future, then, of course, we're going to be smart enough to be able to come back. I don't anticipate that any alien uh, race is coming to visit us 
for any reason and why would they make themselves so scarce and so mm -hmm. so mystical and invisible yeah. to us but yeah us in the future and this could be the future being 40 million years yes not talking about 200 years this no. is not some sort of you know back to the future 3 business yes this is like this is like us we've already moved off the planet onto mm -hmm. some some sort of uh, O'Neill cylinder mm. and we've come up with the possibility of coming back and visiting the old people on earth I like this and uh, and for various reasons which we'll probably get into a little later but uh, I think that's more plausible that it's us rather than it's some other mm -hmm. species that evolved at the exact same time as us over you know all we know is four and a half billion years of Mm -hmm. living in the universe. For all we know, the universe has been around for... Six, ad infinitum. Ad, ad infinitum. So they're... Who knows? Yes. It's so it's all mind boggling. Well, you know who <laughs> might know? Our guest today. Our guest? Well, shall I introduce him? Yes, perfect timing. Today's guest literally wrote the book on the subject. Dr. Mike Masters is a professor of anthropology at Montana Tech University. Dr. Masters received his PhD from The Ohio State University and has participated in archaeological digs all over the world. His passion for the study of human evolution combined with a lifelong interest in UFOs led him to write Identified Flying Objects, in which he postulates that aliens are not in fact alien at all, but are in fact humans from the future time traveling back to better understand their past by better understanding us. Dr. Masters, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. So, before we start going down the rabbit holes, I guess, what prompts or inspires, let's say, a PhD level anthropologist to really take on two of the biggest rabbit holes out there, aliens and time travel? Well, it actually started when I was only about eight years old. Um, some friends were over at our house and I overheard my father telling a story about a UFO he saw. He was a veterinarian in Amish country in a pretty rural part of Northeast Ohio. And um, I just remember it piquing my interest. And it wasn't long after that that he got the book Communion by Whitley Strieber. And I remember very vividly looking up and seeing that book on the living room shelf. And I had this image pop in my mind. For those that aren't familiar, the book has sort of the quintessential gray alien uh, on the cover. And I remember having this mental image of um, uh, an early hominin or chimpanzee-like form, a modern human in the middle, and then this quintessential alien form on the right side. And I had sort of a what-if moment. I hmm. thought, well, what if they're just us? from the future, uh, coming back through time to study their own evolutionary past. So oh, wow. it was something that kind of stuck with me throughout my life. And um, I've always kind of pursued that question and eventually decided to take a little farther and, and spend a good amount of time investigating it and writing a book about it. Now, Dr. Masters, you stress that this is a multidisciplinary scientific study and not just speculation. Tell us about the process and the time that went into it. Yeah, well, once I did finally decide to start putting words to page, it was about, actually, I remember specifically October 2012. And uh, I was coming up on tenure. I was getting close to promotion to full professor. Um, and I thought, you know what, what better time to do it? <laughs> and so I hired a couple research assistants and sort of explained the premise to them. And we uh, mostly focused on the, the the different disciplines, multidisciplinary. It's the ones we focused on specifically were physics, astronomy, astrobiology, and then my field of anthropology and biological anthropology um, foremost. And yeah, over the course of the previous seven years, we just kind of worked to build a case around this, looking at the extraterrestrial hypothesis as an explanation for these craft and the beings that purportedly pilot them. And um, just to kind of see what the most parsimonious explanation was, what made the most sense in the context of what people describe seeing. Um, and it, it seems to fit very neatly into this time travel model. Well, of those disciplines, you mentioned anthropology being your area of, of focus and expertise. Help us understand, through your understanding of human evolution, why this then is not a really massive leap going forward that 
you know, how we might evolve as human beings a thousand years from now, millions of years from now, and how that fits into sort of really creating the foundation for this theory? Yeah, I mean, I started off as a physics and uh, astronomy major as an undergraduate and then switched to anthropology late in my sophomore year and uh, decided to look more at the human evolution side of things. And it's always fascinated me and I'm, I'm really glad I uh, did that. I've gotten the opportunity to work in digs in South Africa, 3.5 million year hominin site, Australopithecus africana specifically, wow. uh, an Neanderthal site dating back to 150,000 years ago in southern France. And wow. I've led digs all around the United States here where I've lived. Um, so the main crux of the argument, I guess, looks at these long-term evolutionary train trends throughout human evolution. So um, initially, we were quadrupedal, just like all other hominoids, just like pretty much every other mammal. We're tetrapods. We have four limbs. We have pentadactyly. We have five digits on each limb. But then something unique happened between six and eight million years ago, and we stood up. We became bipedal, and that's actually the characteristic that defines the hominin clade is our bipedalism. And as that happened, um, what needed to happen is that we had to rotate our heads down so we could see where we're going. And as that took place, there's a number of craniofacial changes that occurred. Uh, most notably, there was a flexing of the basic cranium. So the part of uh, our skull where the brain sits, there's the anterior, the middle, and then the posterior. And as that flexed, in order for us to see, and for all of these changes to take place in association with bipedalism, it created more space within the skull for a brain to grow. Hmm. And we oftentimes talk about the slinky hypothesis, and I brought a little slinky along. To show you. Uh, but, but first of all, I love, I'm loving the props, by the way. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's the best, especially slinkies. I mean, how can you go wrong with that? <laughs> so if we imagine the back end of the slinky is the foramen magnum, the part of our skull where the rest of the body connects through the, the spinal cord. And as that rotated down, so our heads could sit more on top of our skulls, mm -hmm. and our face rotated down and backwards, you can see that there's all this space at the top where it created more room for our enlarged brain. So that took place in association with the reduced face. Um, the traits that now define our specific um, species, Homo sapiens sapiens, is what's called a, a globular or neurocranium. We have a big round head. It's always sort of increased the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes have expanded mediolaterally, meaning left to right. But this globular neurocranium that we have today is a trait that defines us as modern humans, going back about 200,000 years. We also have a chin, a mental eminence, which is unique to our species. Our hominin ancestors don't have that. So long story short, if we look at these trends that have continued, not just in our cranial facial anatomy, but our postcranial anatomy too. And if we project those into the future, we're very likely to have these same traits that are so commonly described in these instances of close encounters, uh, specifically the big round heads, the uh, large wraparound eyes, oval shaped eyes, reduced faces even beyond our own, little tiny pointy chins, smaller ears, uh, more childlike traits. I talk about neoteny and pedomorphosis in the book a lot. So just looking at these dominant trends in human evolution, if they continue into the future, we are likely to look very much like these alien beings. Neoteny no pedomorphosis? Is that what you said? Yeah, I probably should have backtracked. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know what that is. <laughs> They're not common terms. So neoteny is this uh, process that characterizes human evolution as well. And all it is is the retention of juvenileized traits into adulthood. So mm -hmm. we, we retain more infantile, uh, juvenile, ch childlike characteristics, even as adults. And we can already see this uh, throughout human evolution. If we look at a modern human and we compare them to an, an infant chimpanzee and an adult chimpanzee, we're much more like the infant chimpanzee because they have those juvenile traits. And I actually argue in the book, if you look at um, children now, especially young children, even fetuses, they have these very alien-like characteristics, big round heads, mm -hmm. big eyes, yeah. small faces. So if this same trend continues into the future, this pedomorphosis, um, it, it could help explain why they look so infantile. They're oftentimes described as being childlike or uh, sometimes even fetal. I came across a report recently that described them as being overgrown fetuses, I think was the words they used. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so we've explored the future us part of the equation, but uh, what about time travel? If, if we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt that uh, you know, we've cracked that nut sometime in the future, um, how, are we do, how are we doing it? How are we coming back? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and obviously a very important part of this model is what about time travel? Is it even possible? Um, there was a really interesting study by Ehrman et al. that came out in 2009 called Do the Laws of Physics Forbid the Operation of Time Machines? And they looked at all of the different theories, both pro and con. A lot of people like Stephen Hawking was very anti-time travel. So they looked at all of these different theories for how it might work, the actual physics behind it, but then also looking at philosophy and history. Philosophers have been debating this question of time travel for centuries. Um, and what is time? They, they really originated this question. Um, and what they found is that there's nothing in the laws of physics or in any of these other disciplines that forbid the operation of a time machine and specifically backward time travel. So that's a good argument in favor of the fact that it could exist. But the actual how, to get to your question specifically, yeah. um, ever since Einstein published his theory of general relativity back in 1915, there's been a number of solutions to his field equations that were published in association with them that demonstrate how we could create closed time-like curves. And essentially what that means is that we, if we think of a light cone, this is usually how we conceptualize the future, past, and our present, even though the present arguably doesn't exist. If you turn on a beam of light, it shines out, a flashlight, say, it shines out this light. Everything that can take place has to be within the boundaries of the cone that forms as it radiates outward, simply because nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So in order to travel into the past, we have to somehow orient those light cones downward toward the past. And a number of solutions to these field equations, starting uh, with uh, lens and in 1918, we have Van Stockholm in the 1930s, uh, the Godel metric, this rotating infinite, infinitely massive universe. Um, and then eventually with Frank Tipler in 1974, I think it was, published a paper showing how we can create this frame dragging effect, this warpage of space time that reorients those light cones toward the past, which allows an individual to travel locally still into the future. Mm. They're still going forward but globally, they're going back into the past. And, and since then, there's been a number of other studies that have shown the same thing, that if you have a, a large enough mass or a big enough energy and it's rotating at a very high rate of speed, that you're able to create these closed time-like curves. And many descriptions of these UFOs are describing that, that same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of tie this together, uh, a large disc-shaped um, object spinning at a very high rate of speed, emitting a tremendous amount of energy. There's this overwhelming static electricity in the air. Electromagnetism is always described in association with them. So in the context of everything that's been shown about how we do this in the laws of physics uh, seems to fit nicely with how these craft actually appear to be. Hmm. So wow. you've piqued my interest, uh, <laughs> and now then we, we sort of move on to, again, let's sort of grant you, you've, you've passed the next stage of, <laughs> of uh, ver uh, verification, of validation, and now we get to alien abduction, where that's been described in many cases, you know, we kind of hear about the probing or the anal probing or whatever, you yeah. know, but I mean, you, it, it's sometimes made into a joke, but then in, in some cases of people have described some pretty horrible events, whether it be to farm animals back in the day with cows and whatever. But basically, if you were to zoom out and look at it, you'd say, you could say objectively, well, there's something going on. There's some learnings, you know, that, that are, something's trying to be derived from it. It's not just random. Mm -hmm. So you've described in the book that, yes, well, this could be scientific research from future us coming back here to understand something about what's going on here that could help in the future, whatever that might be. So let me put you on the spot. Again, you're an anthropologist. Let's say we figure out the time travel, as we said uh, earlier, and now you're being asked to go back into the past to be part of a team to go and do some research. First of all, are abductions on the table? And, and secondly, would you, would you be up for it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
even just to have the opportunity to meet future humans in our time and to observe their morphology, their craniofacial form, their technology, their, their way of communicating, which by all accounts seems to be telepathy, which is fascinating to me. At least at some point in the distant future, we may acquire that ability, whether it be a technological implant or just some aspect of the brain itself. I, there's no way I could know that. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely go along. Uh, I think it would be tremendously fascinating to go to any point in the future, and especially because so many of these reports, there is um, a really interesting study by the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation, a former astronaut who was really interested in this question. Of Sixth man place. to walk on the moon. Yeah, yeah. And, and they found that the overwhelming majority of contactee experience were were positive. They really enjoyed interacting with these beings. They describe this um, this really impactful sense of empathy and love, and hmm. always talking about avoiding violence and war. So to be able to live in that world, or even to visit it for a short period of time, I think would not only be really mind opening, but it would also be uh, a really great experience just to feel that more evolved sense of human society and, and love and compassion. Um, but to your question about w what we would do or why we would do it, yeah, absolutely. Abductions are completely on the table. Um, I, I think that the abduction phenomenon is largely anthropologists from the future doing exactly what I would do hmm. if I had access to this technology now. I would pick them up. I would take hair samples, saliva samples, skin samples, fecal samples, as you mentioned, the, the anal probe thing. <laughs> learned so much from poop. I mean, it sounds weird to say, mm -hmm. but that's how we know that we consumed about 7,000 calories per day as Neanderthals, mm. and mostly meat, by the way, is that we found their turds. And we could break those down and look at the molecular composition and realize that this was their diet. So. If you want to learn not just about people's diet, but so many other things about them, uh, you can definitely do that through fecal matter. Um, so beyond that, I mean, they picked them up. They, uh, and I I'd like to preface this by saying too, that this is a more tenuous part of the argument. We don't have proof of this happening. Recently, the Navy uh, and the Pentagon confirmed the Tic Tac UFOs that were observed in 2004, and then another one more recently. So we have confirmed of these craft now, which I think is great, but we still don't have anything that we can really put our finger on and say, yes, that's an abduction and that's happening. Um, so with that said, if we do take these people seriously and if we do look at all of these different reports, the fact that they're doing exactly what we as anthropologists would do if we had access to this technology really indicates to me that they are, in fact, us and they're largely here to gather information. It, it seems weird to me, though, because uh, we document everything, seemingly, in this uh, day and age. So if it is, in fact, we coming back to investigate us, what exactly are we trying to learn? Because isn't it all laid out on the table? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. If it would almost seem, and based on the physical traits most commonly described, and especially those gray alien forms, that this is a very distant point in our future. We're talking tens of thousands of years. And even with our best technology to archive paintings and, and the data that we have now electronically, look how fast our iPhones change and our computers mm -hmm. change. E even if you were to go back and try to find information from 100 years ago, especially with wars, we're constantly blowing up archives and, and destroying monuments and bits of information. Um, it, it's possible that they won't survive. And, and it may also help explain why we don't just see regular old humans that often. Why would we come back to a time where we already have that information? It would make more sense to come back to a time when we don't have it anymore. We've lost that. It's not available to us, and especially the biological data. So does this particular hypothesis, which is the us, the future us, coming back, time travel to, again, learn more about previous generations of human beings uh, on the evolutionary track to probably help uh, whatever it is we're trying to solve in the future. Does that, though, take off the table the idea that there's also possibly other intelligent species in the universe who also are traveling throughout the universe and potentially even coming here as well? 
No, not at all. I, I don't see these as mutually exclusive at all. And I, I also acknowledge the uh, psychocultural hypothesis in the book that it's really once we started to become spacefaring beings ourselves that we get more UFO reports and we would have a tendency to anthropomorphize those as well and interject our own appearance onto them um, by thinking, well, if we're going to space, there must be all of these other civilizations that are also doing it and that those things need to be considered. Um, but it, the fact that life arose here on Earth so soon after it could, uh, in the context of the 4.5 billion year history of the Earth, 3.7 billion years, we start to get prokaryotes. And we were very simple cell, single cellular organisms for a long time, reproducing um, just by mitosis, dividing. And it took a very long time to get to where we are. So that could definitely happen on another planet. However, it's very unlikely that on that planet, wherever it is in the universe, that they would have a similar gravity to us. It's already difficult for us to walk bipedally. We suffer from what's known as the perils of being bipedal, hmm. a paper by the former director of the Natural History Museum in Cleveland published this back in the 70s. Uh, Bruce Latimer was his name specifically, that we suffer from things like uh, herniated discs, hmm. bad knees, bad necks, um, uh, varicose veins, hernias, hemorrhoids, all of these things are a negative result of being bipedal. So if we had a slightly larger planet that was more than 9.8 meters per second squared gravity, we're not likely to be bipedal at all. And what we found from a number of studies carried out by the Arecibo Observatory in Costa Rica, that only about 2.2% of all the planets that have been discovered as part of the Kepler mission are actually the same size as or smaller than Earth. So if we have more gravity, we're not likely to be bipedal like we are. It's very hard for us here. We're one of the only mammals that is uh, habitually bipedal. If they have a different chemical composition, a different distance from their sun, different atmosphere, they're not likely to have the same DNA coding system that we have. There's so many reasons why they wouldn't look anything like us. So I definitely don't mm. discount that there's life on other planets. I just don't think that it necessarily helps explain the UFO phenomenon and the contact, the experiences that are so ubiquitously reported. So we are special, Pete, to some degree, it sounds like. We're special. You, we're special. Yeah. special yes. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to think so anyways. Uh, look, this is, this is wildly fascinating. We could go on all day about this, uh, but we really appreciate you not, uh, not only sort of taking us on a journey, but also doing it with you know, the benefit of your background, expertise, and pedigree as, as, a, you know, as, as an anthropologist and taking a real serious look at something that I think is obviously something that at the very least fascinates a lot of people and at the very most is something that people are going to consider more and more as we go forward. So thanks for that. Where can people find more about your work? Uh, well, I have a website for the book and I have a new book coming out later this year. Uh, the website's just a shortened version of the title, Identified Flying Objects. So I-D-F-L-Y-O-B-J, idflyobj.com. And there's links to um, all of the different formats of the book, audiobook, ebook, uh, and obviously paperback. And some more information about speaking events, which have obviously been somewhat curbed on account of the virgin soil pandemic we're all dealing with. But um, there's just keeping people up to date largely through the website. And I strongly recommend, it's not just, again, a fascinating read as, as, as a sci-fi uh, you know, book might be in this particular case, it's kind of like you're reading, I don't want to say a textbook because that might sound dry to people, but it's certainly you're being taken with the benefit of the sort of the parallel scientific explanation or theorization for everything that's being tabled, yeah. which you can appreciate kind of like Star Trek back in the day, right? Like when they would at least you introduce know, the new ideas and go and explore. And, and, but you'd be like, Oh, that's interesting because they explain the science behind it theoretically. I could see that existing one day. And as we know, many of those things do exist. Some of it is in my- Speaking of too, yeah. the prime directive in, in, in that show. I mean, trying to avoid interjecting yourself or influencing them too much. That's the same thing we see with this phenomenon. And you would expect that of a time travel model, but not necessarily if another being schlepped across the universe to get here. We would expect them to at least get out and say hello or kill us all and take our resources yeah, or something. But the fact that that doesn't happen, I think, lends more credence to this time travel model as well. Very good point and great point to end on. Thanks a lot, Dr. Masters, for joining us and we'll catch up with you down the line. Appreciate it. All right, thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate you. It.
So Pete, where are you now after talking to Dr. Mike Masters for a while? Are you leaning towards the possibility that we are in fact be, <laughs> being visited by future versions of us? Well, I uh, believe it even more now. I mm. thought we would be talking to someone who's... Uh, out there? A little bit out there, yeah. I didn't know much about Dr. Mike Masters before today. And it seems that he's a very intelligent man mm -hmm. and has done a lot of research into this and believes it with all his, with all his heart. So mm -hmm. I think he's got a point and it's very possible. Well, it's interesting the approach from an anthropologist, right? I mean, you've heard also uh, probably a thousand books written on different subjects of UFOlogy with various ranges within the spectrum of credible to crazy or whatever it might be. But what I had never come across was the idea of an anthropologist's perspective on this. So we as humans or present day humans are, are often guilty of a believing somehow, whether stated or not, that evolution ended here, right? Like we're done. Yeah. Like it was always, all those like Homo erectus, Cro-Magnon, finished with us. Every day. I, I mean, why would you think, <laughs> why would you go through life, you know, going to the pharmacy thinking that... Yeah, yeah, that there's two million, three million, four million years, or some people might say no, because we might not be around. Well, that's a what if. That might be, that's, well, that's a question for another what if. Yes. But that's a good point. It's like yes. we're living in a nihilist society where we're about, we assume we're all going to die, that global warming is going to mm -hmm. knock us off, we're going to have to leave the planet. This world may be over, so why would we even imagine mm. that there's another all the sci-fi is dystopian. Almost every future version or vision of humanity is post-nuclear war or post-zombie apocalypse or post-whatever. Yeah. And people don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking, A, about a long-term future for the species, these days especially, but B, they don't postulate the fact that, well, wait a sec, if Homo habilis and Neanderthal looked like this, 100,000, 200,000, whatever, to three-point no, mil, yeah, whatever, no. then what would we evolved to look like in a million or two million years. And Dr. Mike Masters makes a very good point that everything is trending. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name off the top of my head about the uh, the the immature thing. The but, fetus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like the idea that we actually are taking on features of... We're becoming fetal. We're becoming fetal. Yeah, the aliens are all, they all look like uh, babies. giant fetuses, giant <laughs> babies. And, or babies all look like, well, obviously aliens look like giant giant babies egg or chicken yeah. there and i mean i was happy because i was i've been telling people for years that i am i am devolving and i'm getting more immature you as certainly are but in terms of devolving. traits though like i mean it's very interesting because without that connection the you know the little green men you talked about or the gray that we've seen in movies it was just some sort of abstract thing that oh sure whatever it was somebody's idea as to what an off planet being might look like but if you do start to, and again, I mentioned my brother-in-law before, he had, he had pitched this idea that global warming, which obviously isn't that far-fetched, even though he was pitching this 20 years ago, ultimately forced us underground. As a species, the sun got hot, whatever it was, the, 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 the ozone layer was too, whatever, and we could no longer live on the surface of the earth. And human, human society moved underground and lived underground for thousands and millions of years. And his theory was that, well, obviously, if you were living underground, you'd get shorter, you would have, you know, the mm -hmm. you, your eyes would be bigger because it'd be less light. All of the same things as kind of Dr. Masters was talking about will be part of our natural evolution. But again, from an anthropologist, that now sort of, it makes the whole idea a lot more plausible. Wow. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lot to, I mean, prime directives, we're talking about, you know, a whole bunch of different things. But in the end, Again, you talked off the top. The idea of somebody coming here from, you know, some other galaxy and whatever and just watching us for a while, yeah. visiting occasionally, it doesn't sound sneaking it, it sounds less plausible than this, which at least there's stake here. If we, meaning the future us, are them, are them coming back here, we're coming back for a reason. Yeah. There'd be, there'd, it'd be more than just curiosity. We, that w there would have to be something we think we can learn that's going to help us in the future. I think so.
The perils Solved. of being bipedal <laughs> yes. was my favorite line. If I had a nickel for every time <laughs> I said that. If you like this episode and want to spend more time with Dr. Mike Masters, well, stick around. Click on the link in the description below to check out our extended audio version. We carry on the conversation with Dr. Mike Masters. We'll see you next time on another What If Discussed. <laughs> <laughs>